Today is September 21st, 2011, the first day of fall. And here we go with chapter two, section 2.1, describing a location and a distribution. Okay. This particular chapter only has two sections. We're going to talk about relative position and a distribution. Um, and then in 2.2, we're going to do uh, a lot of heavy lifting. We may introduce the idea of a normal distribution. Okay, in this particular section, we're going to be talking about using percentiles to, to measure your relative position in, or to measure a relative position in a distribution. We're going to talk about interpreting something called the, the graph of relative, of cumulative relative frequency, uh, sometimes, sometimes called an ogive. We're going to talk about how to take, uh, how to take a data point and convert it into what's something called a z-score. We're going to transform that data, and then we'll define and describe density curves. This is another, again, another way of looking at a distribution. But let's talk about percentiles first. We've already entered this very, very slightly and without a rigorous definition, the idea of a percentile. We talked about the median score. The median score in a data set is the one that marks the boundary between the lower half of the data set and the upper half of the data set. I use that definition quite wildly. But I also slipped in at various times. I called it, called it the 50th percentile. A percentile, instead of just the 50th, or we just use the, the, the placeholder P, the P percentile of the distribution is the value with P percent of the observations less than it. So when I talked about the 50th percentile, I said, oh, if you're at the median, 50% of the data is below you. If I'm at the pth percentile, p percent is below you. I also call it the first quartile score, the 25th percentile. When I'm at the 25th percentile, 25% of the scores are below me. I call it the Q3 score the 75th percentile, because when I'm at the third quartile score, 75% of the scores are below me. So the P percentile says that P percent of the observations are below it. So far so good? Okay, get this out of the way. All right, so here's a stem plot. Jenny earned an 86 on the test, so she's this, she's this uh, 86 right here, and one in bold. How did she perform relative to the rest of the class? Well, one way we can answer that question is good, or well. <laughs> All right. One way we can answer that question is: What's your percentile? What's your percentile score? How did she do relative to the rest of the class? Well, how many observations are below her? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Hey, 21 scores are below her. Out of how many? 22, 23, 24, 25. What's her percentile score? I believe that would be 84. 21 divided by 70, uh, by 25 is 84. She's at the 84th percentile. So, 86 is a good grade, but the, this 84th percentile says that compared to the rest of the class, she did pretty well. What if she got a score of 86, but she was in the 25th percentile? The class, is smart. the class is really smart, or the test was really easy, and she didn't do so well in that really easy test. That'd be another way of saying that. So this idea of percentile 
gives you an idea of how things are going. I heard a couple of students talking yesterday about their class rank. How did they rank with, the, with respect to their class? You could have a really good GPA, but you could be have a low class rank. So the score themselves tells you one thing. The percentile score tells you another thing. All right. Now, one of the things that we do, one of the things that we do with percentile scores is that we graph them. We graph them into something called the cumulative relative frequency graph, or sometimes called the ogive. This is a graph that shows up a lot on the <coughs> MME, in the, and for some reason in the science section. Okay, how that graph is formed is by calculating the percentile scores for the data set. So here's a data set. Okay, and this is having to do with presidents and what age were they when they were inaugurated. So there were two presidents that were in the age from 40 to 44 when they were inaugur inaugurated. Seven in that next range, 13 in that next range, so on and so forth. Okay, now each one of those ranges has a relative frequency. Oh. 4.5% of the presidents were inaugurated from that 40 to 44 range, for example. Now that's relative frequency. Now I need to make this jump to this thing called cumulative relative frequency. By the way, cumin, cumulative meaning to add up or to accumulate. Okay? The cumulative relative frequency is going to be the sum of all the relative frequencies at or below my mark. So, when I ask for the cumulative frequency for this particular group, it's going to be 4.5% at or below that mark. But what about here? The cumulative fre relative frequency here. Well, it's going to be how many presidents were inaugurated in this 45, 45 to 49 range or before it. It's going to end up being the sum of these two frequencies. So I'm going to say that the number here is going to be 19.9%. 19.9% of the presidents were inaugurated in this range or before it. Help me out with this next one. This is about 20. This one's about 30. It's going to be about 50. It's going to end up being 49.4, I think. 49.4% of the presidents were inaugurated in this range or before it. We are accumulating these relative frequencies. That's why we call it the cumulative relative frequency. Okay, let me write, get rid of my really bad writing. Isn't like, how'd you get 19.9? Yeah. Well, if I add 4.5 with 15.9, 20.4. I get 20.4. How about I just do this? Clear the drawing, and then we'll go ahead. Where's the cumulative relative frequency? Come on. Come in. I'm going the wrong way. Oh, my, my board's not calibrated. Duh. Okay, let's try to go forward. There we go. 20.5, just like Paul said. All right. So cumulative frequency is just the adding up of how many have occurred before that point. Cumulative relative frequency is the percentage that have happened at or before that point. Yes, Paul, I'm very proud of you. <laughs> okay, now this isn't the graph. This is just the raw data on which we're going to base our graph. Here's the graph of cumulative relative frequency. Before the age of 40, no one got inaugurated. So my percentile score at 40 is zero. By the time I get to 45, Two people have been inaugurated, and so at 45, I'm up to 4.5%. Uh, By the time I get to 50, and again, this is the tough part. By the time I get to 50, 20.5% of the presidents have been inaugurated. So before 50, 20.5% of the population is there, and that's why you see that particular pair, 50 and that 
Here's my 55. How many people were inaugurated before the age of 55? Answer, 50%. So there's 55, and there I am going up to 50%. Do you see how the ogive is made? We make, we make a table of cumulative relative frequency, and then we graph those combinations. All right? So, Barack Obama, our 44th president, was inaugurated at the age of 50, 47. Is that unusually young? Well, how do we answer those questions about unusually young? Is he in the third percentile? Is he in the 90th percentile? I mean, you're used to seeing those things from the SAT or the ACT, right? Hey, I got my score of 27 on the math portion of the ACT. Is that good or bad? Well, one way you can answer if that's good or bad, you can find out what's your percentile score. Well, to determine whether Barack Obama was young or old when he was inaugurated, how about we look at his percentile score? Now, I don't have a dot at 47, but what I can do is I can go to 47 on my age line. I can go up to my ogive line, and then I can slide over to... <coughs> My, relative, my cumulative relative frequency axis. And I would guesstimate that his percentile is about 12%. He's in the 12th percentile. Would that make him a relatively young president? Yeah. I would say so. I would say so. Let me clear the drawing. And you can see them in an animated form doing the same thing that we just did. Oh, 11, 11th percentile. I was wrong. Will you ever forgive me? Okay. Now, the other thing we can do in the second question, estimate and interpret the 65th percentile. How old would you have to be to be in the 65th percentile? Okay. Well, what would I do? I would find where the 65th percentile is, about there. I would slide over to my ogive graph, and then drop down. And what's your estimate about what? How old you'd have to be to be in the 65th percentile for president inauguration? 57, something like that. Bless you. Thank you. Okay, and there's them doing the same thing, and they're gonna say 58. I can't, I can't catch a break here. All right. So, percentiles. One way of talking about the relative performance within a group. Another way of talking about relative performance in a group is something called the Z-score, sometimes also called the standardized score. A Z-score tells us how many standard deviations away from the mean does an observation occur and in what direction. The z-score, or the standardized score, tells us how many standard deviations away from the mean I, is my data point, and in what direction. It has a formula. z is equal to x, and we use x to, to uh, signify a data point. X minus the mean, divided by the standard deviation. Again, z-score, standardized score, and they just also call it the standardized value. All right? You're going to come to love the z-score. Precisely average. What if my score is exactly at the mean? What's my z score going to be? If I, if I have, well, let's, assuming that the data set has variation and the standard deviation is a number that's not zero, 
When I'm exactly average, I've got average minus average. That's going to be zero. A z-score of zero means you're exactly average. What if I'm a little bit above average? What if x is a little bit above me, the mean? I'm going to get a positive value. Oh, there's that idea of direction. If I get a positive z-score, I am above average. What if I'm a little bit below average? x minus mean is going to be a negative value. If the z-score is negative, I'm below average. OK? Hey, Jenny, there's Jenny in her 86 again. The class mean was 80, and the standard deviation was 6.07. What's her standardized score? Well, how would we calculate that? The z-score is going to be 86 minus 80, the mean, divided by 6.07. And we're going to get a number that's a little bit, a, a little bit below 1, I think. Do I get a calculator? Or should I just clear the drawing and have them work it out for me? 0.99. OK? So we say that she's 0.99, or about one standard deviation below, sorry, above the mean. Or we say her z-score is about, about 1, about positive 1. Because she wants to be a positive one and be above the mean. She doesn't want to be negative one and be about six points below the mean. No. We want positive z-scores if we're doing something good. So z-scores, relatively easy to calculate. X minus mean divided by the standard deviation. Does anyone require more time on this slide? No. Then we shall go on. OK, here's Jenny again. Hey, not only did she score an 86 on that statistics test, but she also scored 82 on a chemistry test. The chemistry scores had a fairly symmetric distribution with a mean of 76 and a standard deviation of 4. Which test did she do relatively better on? Well, we can answer that question by looking at the z-scores for the two different tests. The z-score for her stats exam, as we already calculated, was 0.99. What's her z-score for her chemistry exam? Her score was 82. The average was 76. And the standard deviation was 4. Let's see. 82 minus 76 is 6 divided by 4. It's a buck and a half. OK, so her stats exam, her z-score is about 1. Her chemistry exam, her z-score is about 1 and a half. So even though she got a 76 on the exam, she actually did relatively better on that exam. She's, a, she's one and a half standard deviations above the mean. That also means, by the way, that her percentile scores on those two exams are off our, her percentile score on her chemistry test is better than the percentile score that she would have gotten on her stats exam. Okay. And there's them doing the same thing, coming up with the same answers this time. So we can look at z-scores to talk about relative achievement. Anyone require more time on this slide? OK. Transforming data. OK. Now, third topic today. First topic was percentiles and ogives. Second topic was z-scores. Third topic is transforming data. What happens? if we have a data set, and then we manipulate that data set. Now, first of all, you may ask, why would we ever want to do that? Well, sometimes it happens in the process of changing units. You're doing your experiments. You measured in inches, but then you find out from Mr. Meacham that they don't use inches at Berkeley High School. They use centimeters or meters. 
your data is all in inches. You have to transform that data into the new unit. What effect does that have on the mean? What effect does that have on, sorry, what effect does that have on measurements of center? What effect does that have on measurements of spread? That's what we're going to talk about here. Hey, you're a bunch of uh, uh, assembly line workers, and you just got your um, profit sharing checks. How does your salary affect it? The act of giving you each $3,000 for, for profit sharing has an effect on your salary, has an effect on this measurements of sal center for your salary and for measurements of spread. That's the kinds of things that we're talking about when we talk about transforming data. All right? If we add or subtract a constant to everything in the data, here's a distribution. Imagine my arms represent some sort of histogram. If I add or subtract the same thing to everything in that data, let's say I add 100, you know what happens to that data? It does this. I'm going to do that again because, one, I was very foolish doing it, and two, not everyone was watching. Here's my original data set. I add 100 to everything in that data set. Watch what happens. Did the center of the data set change? The center was over here, where my shoe is. People in the back can't see my shoe. Okay, I move it over here. Does the data set have a new center? Is it still centered over that shoe? No. So, adding the same number adds that number to the measurement of center. Okay. <coughs> yeah, a is the a is the amount I added. So a is like a is a variable. It's like a it's a it's a placeholder for a number. I demonstrated moving a hundred, for example. A was a hundred in my example. Okay. Okay. But there's this key word right here. But what happens to the spread? As I transform that data by adding A to everything in the data set, did the spread of my data set change? No. Not in the least. So while it affects measurements of center, it does not change measurements of spread as measured by standard deviation, IQR, or range. Adding a constant to a data set does not change measurements of spread. Adding a constant to a data set, to every item in a data set, does change measurements of center. Mean, median, Q1, Q3. Well, Q3 is on a measurement center. Location. So, I deem that there was some unfair question on your test, and I'm I'm resolved to give every one of you four points on that last test. It changes the average or the median score of the test, but it doesn't change the spread of the scores in the test. Does anyone require more time here? Okay, hearing none. So, here's an example given in dot plot form. Again, note that the center changed with the spread as measured by range or by standard deviation or by IQR did not change. All right, moving on. All right, now there's another way we can transform data. And the other way we can transform data is by doing some sort of multiplier by multiplying or dividing by some constant. 
If we multiply by some constant, we'll use the letter B to represent that constant. then the measurements of center also get multiplied by that constant B. And in this case, there is no... Usually this makes people laugh. That was, that was the lamest laugh. Measurements of spread do not change by B, but rather the absolute value of B. For example, we can't have a negative standard deviation. So if B is a, a multiplier and it's got a negative value, it's not going to make the standard deviation negative. It's going to change by the absolute value of that, of that B. Now, how would this occur? Well, the, the example I said, converting inches to centimeters, for example, is a process of multiplying by a constant. That constant happens to be 2.54. The process of changing your salaries by giving you all a 4% raise, that process is a multiplier process. I multiply your salary by 1.04 and Paul gets his new salary. It changes the center and it changes the spread. but it doesn't change the shape. The shape of the distribution will remain, if it started out being skew right, it will remain skew right. If it started out being symmetric, it will remain symmetric. Okay? So, there's two dot plots. One of them before the transformation by multiplying by some value B. The one after, oh, What's the multiplier here? How do I convert, in this case, meters to feet? I imagine I would take the meters and multiply by 3.02, something like that. That's the conversion vector from meters to feet. And what happened? Did the center change? Yes. yes. Did the spread change? Yes. And did the shape change? No. By the way, when I was grading your tests, you may have noticed something, uh, particularly on one of the questions that said, would you compare these two distributions? I wrote this. And then if the discussion of your two distributions, if you mentioned how the centers compared, I put a little check mark next to center. If you mentioned how the shapes were, I put a little check mark on the shapes S. Or if you mentioned something about the spread, I mentioned I put a check mark. So this is a good way of you telling your score about saying, hey, have I talked about when I compared your distributions, the things that we use to describe distributions? Center, spread, shape, outliers. Just a little note. All right. And here is some output about how things change. You'll see that the means changed. The standard deviations changed. All right. Last topic for today, density curve. So we are four topics. First topic was percentiles and ogives. Second topic was z-scores. Third topic is transforming by either adding or multiplying. Last topic, density curves. Now, you made histograms. Hooray, histograms. Histograms take your data, put them into little files, and you create a curve. A density curve is related to a histogram in that they have similar representations. But density curves are idealized so that we can use mathematics and use formulas and things like that to uh, look at the distributions. When we explored quantitative data, we tended to try to make a graph of it in the form of a box plot or a histogram, stem plot. Let's focus again on the stem plot and the histogram. We looked for descriptions of pattern. We looked for our socks. 
shape, outlier, center, spread. Okay? We use numeric summaries to summarize that data in terms of IQR or standard deviation for spread, mean or median for center. Okay? But we're going to look at this density curve and we're going to say the same thing, but what happens if we got so much data that instead of looking at a histogram, we can look at curves instead? Because mathematicians, mathematicians love curves. And if we get enough data, we can start visualizing the data, not as separate, unique bars, but rather, rather of this wonderful, smooth curve that also describes the data. Now, the data usually doesn't actually prescribe exactly to a curve, but usually it's close enough that we can start utilizing some of the other tools of mathematics in order to, to take advantage of the situation. So, if we can have this wonderful thing happen, that data can be looked at as a curve, we're going to have to have some new tools for an analyzing that curve. Does anyone require more time in this slide? I'm so excited about density. Samantha's like, you and you alone. You're like, what? you're not excited about density curves? Okay. You excited? Yeah. Really yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> All right. Wait, so, I'm sorry. Did everyone have enough time? Did anyone require more time? All right. Density curves. So here's our definition of a density curve. First of all, you know a density curve when you see it because the curve is always at or above the horizontal axis. In the same way that the bars of the histogram are always at or above the horizontal axis. We don't have histogram bars that go into negative territory. The second thing that informs you that a density curve is a density curve, or a curve is a density curve, is that the area underneath the curve is always exactly 1. Now, it says 1, and maybe a better way to describe it, it's always exactly 100%. In other words, it represents the 100% of the data that we're investigating. A bell curve is an example of a density curve, and we're going to discuss it specifically tomorrow. But not all, curve, uh, not all density curves are bell curves. We have many different kinds of curves, right? The last thing about the density curve, the area under the curve above any particular interval of values is in proportion to the amount of time those values are found in the distribution. Okay, that's really, really, really wordy. But let's see if we can give you an example. So for example, if we had this histogram that's made up of these purple lines, these purple bars, you can see the, the discrete purple bars? We can say, you know, maybe this red line, which I'm tr trying to trace, can be the idealized form of that data, all right? And if I wanted to say, how many, what proportion of the students, you can hardly see the values here, but this is four and this is six. If I wanted to know how many students scored between a four and a six on this particular test, I would indeed draw in those lines in that interval, but below the curve. I can't draw that very well. If I would calculate the area under that curve, in that interval, that number would be the proportion of students that scored in that range. Now, using calculus, which I am not going to force you to do, or even ask you to do, using calculus, we have a tool that does that really easy. It's called the integral. This is why mathematicians love it so much, because they can use this tool that they're really, really fond of. The integral allows us to find areas under the curve, they want to use that. They want to use that. You do not have to do an integral though. But this is the reason why they love it. Did you use Brown? We'll, we'll talk about it later. Alright? So if 
Foxtrot. I forget who, what's the name of the little geeky boy in Foxtrot. He's the one that's always running computer programs. What's that? Oh. All right. So you can see on his density curve, most of the kids are in the F and D range. And then here he is. interesting. Look at that drawing. All right, so let's describe some density curves and we'll finish up. We're almost out of time, right? Okay. If we are in a situation where we're given a density curve and we're asked to distinguish between a mean and a median, the median is the score on the horizontal axis that breaks the areas in the density curves into two equal, two equal pieces. The areas of the curves are represented with the proportion of the people or observations that fall in a particular range. The median is the part that breaks the curve into two equal halves. The mean, on the other hand, has a separate and, and physical meaning in this case. It's the balance, the balance point. If I actually built the density curve out of wood and found the place where I could get it to balance, not tip one way or the other on some sort of fulcrum, that point would be the mean. So the mean has a physical manifestation in terms of the balance point. Remember, same rules apply from last chapter. If the the density curve is symmetric, or the distribution is symmetric. The mean and the medium are in the same place. Otherwise, the mean gets pulled toward the tails and toward the outliers. Mean gets pulled toward the tail, toward the outliers, in a non-symmetric distribution. All right. I have less than two minutes left. I have only the summary slides to go through at this point. All right. So there's our drawing of that symmetric distribution, mean and mean at the same place. In a, in this case, a right scale, right skew distribution. The mean is pulled toward the tail. All right. And there's our, there's our summary. Relative position using percentile or z-score, please sit down. OGI or cumulative relative frequency graph to help decide what percentiles you're on when you don't have the data in front of you. We transform data and has effects on means, sorry, on centers and spreads, depending on whether you add it or multiply it. And then again, the density curve is an idealized form of a histogram. We use areas under the curve but above intervals to look at proportions of observations that fall in particular areas. All right? You've got the assignment. I would start that assignment tonight, and we'll see you all tomorrow. No, the homework's going to be due on Monday when you take your quiz. You'd be foolish to wait that long, though.